Lord, as always, we love you, Lord, and, and we do thank you, Lord. I thank you so much, Lord, with the relationship that I am able to have with you, Lord God. I know who I am. I know what I deserve. But you are so good, Lord God. I don't know why you love me and you bless me and you speak to me and you encourage me. Because I know I don't deserve those things, Lord God. But, but it says a lot about who you are. That you are a God who loves us. Who watches over us, Lord God. Who will allow us to go through difficulty, Lord. But you're always in control. And there's a reason for everything that you allow. And I pray, Lord, as we study your word tonight, remind us of these things. Remind us, Lord, that there is no one like you. Remind us again that you are that loving Father who is always watching over us. And despite the ups and downs that we face, despite even the things that we might suffer, you'll never leave us nor forsake us. You will always be there with us, Lord. And I think as long as we know that, Lord God, we can make it through. Speak to us tonight, Lord, through your word. We love you. We thank you tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Good to see you once again. If you have a Bible, which I hope you do, Job chapter 2. Job chapter 2. Amen. Give you guys a few seconds to turn there if you're not already there. The book of Job, again, chapter 2. Okay. Hopefully most of you, again, I'm sure most of you uh, were with us last week. If you missed it, it's available. I hope you guys would go back. Very important introduction as we covered a lot of, uh, again, a lot of the things that you want to know as we go through this. Very, it's a long book. And so it's very important that you understand the introduction at the very beginning. Please go back and listen to that. But I want to kind of begin by just reminding everybody the theme of the book. Again, what I called it, again, I, I labeled it trusting God in suffering. And I, and I love that. And I think this is such an important lesson because if there's something that we can all agree upon is that we all suffer from time to time. We will all experience difficulty. We all will face hard times. It makes no difference. Our age, right? Our gender, what type of career we have, whether we're the boss or whether we're the, the bottom guy on the totem pole, right? It makes no difference how much money we have in our bank account. We could eat all the right foods. We could go to the gym. We could pay our taxes. We can obey the law. Again, we can come to church, but it makes no difference. Because all of us will suffer. Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation. Okay? That just comes with the territory. And we need to understand that. Now, why does it come with the territory? Why will we suffer? Why is that something, and again, that we should just expect? And the answer is that we live in a world that is fallen. All we got to do is turn on the news and we can see how bad this world is. And if there's one thing, again, we can also agree upon is that this world is getting worse. And as this world continues to get worse, our lives are impacted by this ungodly world that we live in, okay? We suffer the effects or the consequences, even the negative influences of this ungodly world around us. But that's not all. Because the bad news is that for Christians, it's even worse than that. You guys know that? How many of you, again, came to the Lord, and when you came to the Lord, things actually got worse, right? And they, I've experienced that, again. It's just part of the territory. Why? Why do, do things become harder? Why are they more difficult? Well, because the Bible tells us that Satan is the ruler of this world. He's running the show down here, okay? He does, and we see it as we see all the ugliness that's taking place, right? We can't turn on the news one day without seeing how ugly this world is. Continually people suffering and people dying. And again, people experiencing the effects of this ungodly world. And as God's children, we are in the enemy's crosshairs. He's always after us, right? We know he's here to still kill and destroy. We know that. That's what he does. And he hates us because he is darkness and we are children of the light. And so long as we are in this world... He will be after us, okay? Again, it just comes with the territory. He is continually going to come after us, right? Wanting to still kill and destroy our lives. And he is always going to try to do what he's always done from the very beginning, which is what? Tempt God's children to sin. Isn't that what he's always done? Isn't that what he did to Adam and Eve in the very beginning? That's what he does. That's what he's about. He wants us to turn against God, to 
disobey God, to turn our backs on God. And he continually tempts us with this world and the things in this world to try to make us do that. The good news is, if you are a child of God, and we talked about this last week, filled with God's Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us, greater is he that is in us than what? Than he that is in this world. And for that reason, Satan cannot harm us. He can tempt us. He can lie to us. He can whisper in our ear. Again, he can try to do all these things, but he can't touch us. He can't lay a finger on us. I love that, right? It's good news. He can't touch us. He cannot do anything without God's permission. I love that, right? That puts a smile on my face, just that alone. Satan can do nothing against one of God's children. Now, if you're not one of God's children, if you are not filled with the Holy Spirit, you're in bad shape. You really are because you have no protection. That's what the Bible teaches. Again, we talked about this last week. But again, so long as you are a child of God, we are protected by God. And the only time Satan can get to us is when God allows it. Now, someone might ask the question, why would God allow his children to go through trials? Is anyone thinking that tonight? You should. I hope you think about these things. Let me give you a couple reasons. Three reasons why God allows his children to be tested. I encourage you to write this stuff down. Number one, it is through our testing that we learn and grow from the tests we take. Isn't that right? We learn and grow from the tests we take. We all do. And God wants us to learn. And God wants us to grow and to mature spiritually. And so God allows his children to be tested. Number one. Number two. Our testings are meant to draw us closer to God. That's what God desires. Every time we are tested, we have a choice to run from God or to run to God. Amen? Hopefully, we run to God. More than ever before, that's when we need God, when we're going through tests. And so getting mad at him or blaming him or getting upset or bitter at him is the complete, total wrong thing to do. We should run close to God. Draw near to God, right? Number three. God allows his children to be tested because when we pass the test, and hopefully we pass the test, right, we bring God glory. We make God look good, amen? We make God proud, and this is beautiful, and we've seen this. And so God allows, understand, his children to be tested. There are times when God allows his children to be tested. Now, you might be here, and you might say, but wait a minute, I don't like taking tests. And most people don't like taking tests. But here's the good thing about taking tests that God allows. The Bible teaches, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. You need to know this verse if you don't know this one. This is one of the, one, to me, it was one of the top ten here. No temptation or testing has overtaken you, has come upon you, except that which is common to man. In other words, we, there's nothing you're going through that no one has never gone through before, Okay? But God is faithful. Amen? Who will not allow you to be tempted or tested beyond what you are able? Don't you love that? That should put another smile on your face tonight. There's nothing that God will allow you to go through that he knows you can't handle. He wouldn't put you through it if he knew you couldn't handle it. But with the temptation... He will also make the way of escape so that you will be able to bear it, so that you can endure it, so that you can get through it. This is good news. That if you're facing something and you're a child of God, God knows that you can get through it. God wouldn't put you through it if you couldn't handle it. And because God loves you, you just hang on to God, right? You hang on to Jesus because he will see you through. He will see you through. I want to encourage you tonight, if you're here and you're in the midst of a trial, that if God brought you to it, he will see you through it. Okay? Always remember that. This is so beautiful. And I want to remind you about this as we now turn to the book of Job chapter 2. And we see this taking place in Job's life. Job has been tested. But God knew what Job could handle, right? God knew Job's heart. Now, for those of you who weren't with us, I'm going to summarize chapter 1 very, very quickly, okay? We were first introduced to Job in the beginning of the book, right? The man from the land of 
Oz or Uz, right? Uz, right? This is not the Wizard of Oz. This is the man from Uz, okay? And we learned about Job. We learned that Job was a godly man, right? He lived, lived blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned from evil. He was a godly man, and God was proud of him. He obeyed God. He served him. He feared God. In other words, he honored and respected God as his father, as all of us should. Well, the Bible teaches that with obedience comes blessing. And the second thing we learned about Job is that he was blessed, wasn't he? He was blessed big time. He was so prosperous. Again, the Bible says that he was the wealthiest man of all the people that lived in the east. God had blessed his life. He was obedient. And he was rich. He was, again, big time rich. But despite his riches, his riches never turned his heart away from God. Okay? He still put God first. He still honored God with all he had. And we saw the third thing was that he was a godly father, wasn't he? Job had ten kids, seven boys, three girls. And even though his kids were grown, Job still prayed for them, didn't he? He still sacrificed for them. He was worried if they had sinned against God. And so Job offered sacrifices on their behalf. And I love it because it was such a beautiful lesson for, for fathers specifically, but I believe both parents, right? To love our kids and that we truly love our kids again. The most important thing we'll care about in their life is their relationship with God, right? What good is it if they hit the lottery, if they become doctors or lawyers or scientists or astronauts, and they wind up in hell? What good is that? The most important thing we should want is that our kids have a right relationship with God. And we saw that. Job was a godly man. He was a rich man. He was a good, godly father. And despite being all these things, good things happen to bad people, don't they? God allowed him to be tested, and that's what we read about the trial that he faced. Verse 6, chapter 1, now there was a day when the sons of God, the angels, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Now again, we read here again that all the angels come before God, God's on his throne, this is in heaven, and God knowing what Satan was up to asked the question, Satan, what you been up to, Right? God knew. God knew Satan had been trying to get at Job. But Job wouldn't bite. Job would not give in to sin. Right? And so what happened? Satan responded, well, God, the only reason he loves you, right? The only reason he serves you, the only reason he worships you is because you protect him and you prosper him. But he said what? In verse 11. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has. Take it away. And he will curse you to your face, God, right? He'll curse you to your face. Put him through the test. Take his stuff away. Take away all that you blessed him with. And he'll turn his back on you, God. But is that what happened? No, it's not what happened. God knew Job's heart, didn't he? Just like he knows our heart. And to settle the issue and to prove Satan wrong, God said, okay, go ahead. I will let you do it. I will allow you to take everything away from him. You just can't touch him physically. Remember that. You can't touch him physically. And so what happened? Satan left. Satan sent a band of thieves to steal all of Job's oxen and donkeys. He sent lightning to strike all of Job's sheep, sent raiders to take all of Job's camels, and lastly, he sent a tornado to kill all of Job's ten kids. Can you imagine that? Again, we can't even imagine losing one kid. Lord, help us. right? Lord, have mercy on the parents who've had, lost one child. But imagine losing all your kids all your kids. And it was so incredible, again, as I shared last week, as, as I'm reading this and I'm imagining in just a matter of minutes, Job lost everything. Literally. He lost it all. Everything, right? Everything that he had. But despite losing everything, he responded incredibly, didn't he? He was an example to us. He was an example. These circumstances could have allowed him to get mad at God, to blame God, to turn his back on God, but that's not what Job allowed. Job, in fact, did the opposite. Instead of cursing God like Satan said he would, what did Job say? Blessed be the name of what? Of the Lord, right? Blessed be, bless God. It doesn't matter, God. 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to serve you anyways, God. I'm going to love you anyways. And it was beautiful because Job proved Satan wrong and Job proved that God was right, what? All along. Think about that. The next time you go through a trial, are you going to prove God right about you that you can handle and you can continue to stay close to God? Or are you going to prove Satan right? And that was incredible because we saw again the lesson here that he passed the test, that he was loyal. But there's something, again, that we better understand even when we pass tests that we go through, and that's this. James 4, 7, James writes that we are to submit ourselves to God. We are to what? Resist the devil. Don't give in. And he will what? Flee. He'll flee. Like a drug dealer coming to you to trying to sell you drugs, right? Just tell him no. He'll leave, Right? Make them leave. Don't buy. Don't give in. Say no. Keep saying no. Eventually, they're going to give up. That's the same thing. You can pass the test, okay? You can say no. You resist the devil. You resist the temptation. And eventually, Satan will flee. But it doesn't mean he's going to give up on you. He'll come back tomorrow, right? He'll come back the next day. We can count on that. He's not going to give up. And this is where we pick it up. In chapter 2, as Job now, again, is tested for the second time, okay? Job is tested for the second time, sorry. Amen. Let's pick it up here again. In verse 1, chapter 2, we're not even going to finish the whole chapter tonight. We're going to look at round 2, right? I love this. Round 2. Round 2 of Job's battle with Satan. And the first thing we're going to see is Satan's second accusation okay satan's second accusation verse one here it says this it says again there was a day when the sons of god these are the angels came to present themselves before the lord and satan also came among them to present himself before the lord now again we read this in chapter one right we're familiar with this already for the second time we see the angels of god Coming before God's throne. Why are they coming? They're coming to give an account of their actions. Everyone has jobs, isn't it? Don't all the angels have jobs? All of them. And they're coming to give an account of their ministry, whether their ministry is on heaven or in heaven or on earth. And Satan here also, get this, has to come before God to give an account. Isn't that interesting? Now, I like that, because what does that show us? That reminds us of two things, okay? It reminds us of two things. Number one, it reminds us that all of God's creatures are accountable to him. Did you guys know that? All of God's creatures. We are God's creation, amen? We didn't come from monkeys? No, we're all God's creation. And all of God's creatures must answer for the things that they have done. And I love this, because this is scripture. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.10, we need to know this verse. For we must, what? All appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Do you guys get that? One day, every single person must stand before God and give an account for the things that they've done. That's what he says. So that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. What a lesson that we should remind ourselves of, huh? We're all going to stand before God one day. Every single one of us, every single one, again, of God's creatures is going to have to give an account to God, to their creator. And I love this because, again, oh, what a reminder. We better prepare for this day, amen? We better live this day again with no regrets, not standing before God with regrets because this is going to happen. Now, when we stand before God, I believe specifically there's two things that we're going to have to answer for. And the most important thing we're going to have to answer to God for is this question. What did we do with God's son, Jesus? That's the most important question we're going to have to answer, guys. What did you do? Did you receive him as your personal Lord and Savior of your soul? Or did you reject him? That's that's the question right there. There's nothing more important than that. And we're going to have to answer to God for that. What did we do? 
Did we put him off? Did we tell him manana? Or did we receive him as our Savior and serve him as our Lord? That's the number one question. Again, all of us, every person on earth, every person who ever lived is going to have to stand before God and give an account for what they did with Jesus. But then there's the second thing. All of us are blessed in this room. Can you say amen? Has God been good to us? Yes. All of us are going to have to stand before God and we're going to have to give an account for what we did with our time. Someone write down time. What we did with our talents, our gifts, our skills, our abilities. It's all from God. And what we did with our treasures. Three things. What we did with our time. Were we wasteful? What we did with our talents. Did we use them? What we did with our treasure, what did we did with it? Did we hoard it? Were we selfish? What did we do with all that God had entrusted to us? The Bible teaches that everything belongs to God, everything. And he entrusts these things to his kids. And he expects us to be good stewards of all that he's given us. And we will give an account. Mark your words. Again, mark my words. We will give an account for what we did. So number one, again, when I'm reminded about Satan and all the angels having to stand before God, it reminds me, number one, that we're all going to have to do this because God is our creator. But the second thing that this teaches us, the second thing that this teaches me, is that although Satan might be the ruler of this world, God still rules over him. Isn't that right? God still rules over him, and I love that. That should put a smile on your face tonight, right? It doesn't matter what he tries or what he's up to. God still is in control. God still makes Satan come before him to answer to God. And that's what we read happens again, once again, in chapter 2. Verse 2, it says here, And the Lord said to Satan, from where have you come, right? Or I'll put it in my words, so what you've been up to, right? That's what God's telling them. Now, again, did, did God know what he had been up to? Of course. God knows everything, right? God knows everything. But I love this because God is initiating conversation, right? That's what this is about. God knows what Satan had been up to. God knew chapter 1, didn't he? He knew that Satan had Stripped away everything from Job, trying to get Job to fall, trying to break Job down, tried to make Job turn his back on God. God knew all of this. God knows everything. But because God knew all of this, he asked Satan the question, so what you've been up to, right? In other words, Satan, have you been successful, right? You were just up here bragging the other day that you could make Job fall. Now, Satan is proud, isn't he? He made Adam and Eve fall, and he makes people fall all the time. But did he make Job fall? No. Okay? He did not make Job fall. And so look what Satan says again, like before. Satan answered the Lord and said, I've been going to and fro on the earth and, and walking up and down upon it. Now, we know that's what Satan does, right? We talked about it. He is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour that's what he does that's all he does he's in the full-time business of hunting people down destroying people's lives right breaking up families and marriages and homes that's all he does that's all he does looking for someone to devour verse 3 the lord said to satan have you considered my servant job now that should sound familiar because those were the same words God asked Satan the first time. He says that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Now, those are the same exact words from last time, and that's important. Why? Because God's basically telling Satan, and again, when I think about this, it puts a smile on my face, and this is literally what put the most biggest smile on my face, is can you imagine God telling Satan what he's telling him? He is repeating the same words on purpose. Why? How many believe God has a sense of humor? Okay? 
He's reminding Satan. Satan, you remember the conversation we had the other day? When you were up here boasting, when you were up here saying that you were going to make Job fall, that if I gave you permission, you would get him to curse me? Well, it didn't happen, Satan. That's what God's telling him. Again, I read this seriously, and I honestly believe that God had a smile on his face when God was talking. He's taunting Satan, because that's all Satan does to everybody else, isn't he? And now God's given him a taste of his own medicine. You thought, you thought you could get Job to turn his back on me. But, what did, but, but remind me, Satan, what did Job do? Did he curse me, or did he bless my name? Again, God was proud, and I love this. Job had proven Satan wrong, and now God is rubbing Satan's face in it. Don't you love that? How many of you, again, I can't wait till Satan gets a taste of his own medicine. Seriously, that's what I see here. God is in control. Again, God was excited. God was happy. God was blessed. The, 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 the choices, the godly choices of his children bless God's heart, and that's exactly what we see here. He tells Satan, look. He, speaking of Job, still, still holds fast his integrity. Although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. What's God saying? God says, you're the one that's bad, Satan, not Job. You, because of your words, because of what you said, allowed me to allow you to punish him. But Job didn't deserve it, right? He didn't deserve it. He did not deserve it. And so God's pointing the finger back at Satan saying, you're the bad one. You did this. You're the one, again, that has done wrong. It was never Job at all. It was all you, Satan. It was all you. Verse 4. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin. Can you imagine Satan saying that? Skin for skin. All that a man has, he will give for his life. Satan was wrong. He was defeated. He was humiliated. But in his anger, he counters. He comes back, right? And he tells God, skin for skin. And what does that mean? Well, skin for skin was a proverb that was used to describe the trading of animal skins. People would trade skins back in those times. And he was saying skin for skin. What did he mean by that? Well, what he meant was that Job was fine. He was insinuating that Job was fine as long as it wasn't his skin. As long as nothing happened to his skin. In other words, Job would be okay trading his children in as long as nothing happened to him personally. And again, this was a direct attack on Job, calling Job selfish, saying Job was unloving, saying that he would be willing again to give up his kids if it meant saving his own life. Of course, it was all a lie. But this is what Satan was insinuating. He says all that a man has, he will give for his own life. He'll give up his kids. He'll give up his money. He'll give up everything as long as he's okay, as long as he's not harmed physically. And this is what he was insinuating Job would do. Verse 5, he says, But stretch out your hand, God, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. Satan tells God, if you give me the power to harm Job physically, where I can get at him physically, I can take away his health, then, God, I guarantee Job's faith will fail. I guarantee, again, I can get Job to curse you to your face. Now, think about it. Think about what Satan is saying. This is kind of interesting. Satan is saying, People can lose money, but you know what? They can make money, right? They can just get another job. Satan is even saying, as sad as this sounds, Job can always have more kids. That's what he's saying. But he only has one life. You harm him physically. You strike him with a disease. 
You give him cancer. That's what he's saying. He only has one life. Then and only then, Job will face his breaking point, and he will get mad at you, God. He will turn away from you. Now, I want you to think about that for a second because this is kind of interesting. I want you to think to the best of your ability and ask yourself the question, do you have a breaking point? Is there something if God allowed in your life, it would make you turn your back on God? I want you to think about that because that's pretty heavy duty. If he took all your finances away, that's what happened to Job the first time, right? The first attack was financial. All his wealth was stripped from him. He went from the wealthiest man to having nothing. Would that make you turn your back on God? Would that get you mad at God where you would blame God and say, forget it. I'm not going to church ever again. I ain't serving God no more. What if God took one of your kids? And again, this is serious. This is heavy-duty stuff. But it's an interesting question. What if God took one of your parents? Would that do it? Would that break you? Would that break your faith in God? And then the last one, according to what Satan said, what if God gave you cancer? Would that break you? Would that, would, would that do it? If God put you on your back in a hospital bed? Would that ruin your faith? It's interesting. Again, this is what Satan was insinuating. But as we read this, we have to ask ourselves, is there something? And we've got to consider, again, what type of faith do we have? Do we have a faith that is only as strong so long as God doesn't do X? Or do we have a faith that says, Lord, me and you tell the wheels fall off, right? Seriously. We need to have that attitude again. This is, again, the kind of faith that Job had. Verse 6. The Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand. Now, let's stop right there. How many of you feel sorry for Job already, right? Poor Job. He's, if he, he didn't know about this, remember. But if he heard about this, he'd be going, God, no, no, right? No, no, pick someone else, right? Behold, God says, he is in your hand. I'm, I'm putting him in your hands. I'm giving you permission. Only God said what? Spare his life. God says, right? God told him, okay. I'll let you afflict him. I'll let you strike him with a disease. But remember, did God know Job's heart? Did God know what Job could handle? Always important to remember that. God said, okay, you can touch him. You can mess with him. You can strike him. You can give him cancer. But you can't kill him. You can't kill him. Now again, hopefully, as you hear this and as you read this, not only do you feel sorry for Job, but I want to ask you tonight, how many of you right now feel like that's not fair? Why did God allow that? Raise your hand. Seriously. You should, right? You should feel that way. And I don't blame you for feeling that way. You should wonder, why, God, that's kind of not right. Why are you allowing this to happen? Remember, had Job deserved this? No, he didn't. And so I hope you feel that way. And again, I'm being honest with you. As I read this, I'm like, wow, that's pretty heavy duty. But there's something interesting about this. You might think to yourself, as I do, God, that's not fair. Why did you allow this to happen to Job? How many of us have looked around and we've seen people that we know and love who didn't deserve something to happen, yet something bad happened to them? Has it happened to us? And we felt like, God, that's, why, God? Seriously. And we're genuine and we, and we really mean this. Not that we're mad at God, but again, we, it's just hard. It's hard. But specifically in those times, there's a lesson that we better understand. Something that we need to remind ourselves, and that's this. That we exist for God. God does not exist for us. Write that down. That's heavy. We exist for God. God does not exist for us. He is the creator, isn't he? And we are his creation. It's not the other way around. And we better understand this. And when we understand this, it'll give us that proper perspective. The Apostle Paul, once again, Colossians 1.16, says this. He says, for by him, by him, God, Jesus, all things were created. Amen? Everything. For by God, all things were created. We know that. 
in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions. He's talking about kingdoms, all these things, or rulers or authorities. Notice, all things were created through him and what? For him. That's important. Why did God create us? We were created for who? For him. Don't ever forget that, okay? When we had the attitude that, again, we were created for ourselves to just do whatever we want to do, live how we want to do, again, that's the wrong perspective. That's not Bible, okay? We are God's creation created for him. And because we are his creation, if I can say this frankly, God can do with us whatever he wants. Isn't that right? That's the reality. Again, I know that sounds hard, but that's the reality. We're his creature. He created us. And because he's the creator, because he's God, he can do whatever he wants with what he created. Now, that sounds kind of scary. And if God was an evil God or a mean God or a bad God, or even an indifferent God, meaning a God who didn't care, we would be in trouble. Isn't that right? We would be in trouble. But what's the good news? Our God is a good God. Amen? That's the good news. Our God is a good God, which means that even in the midst of trial, even in the midst of struggle, even when God allows us to suffer and go through difficulty, what can we always remember because we serve a good God? You know the verse. We know that all things, what does all things mean? That means everything good and bad, everything, work together for good, for our good. It might not seem like it, but it's for our good. God knows to those who love God, right, specifically, this is who it applies to, and to those who are called according to his purpose. Let me ask you, did God call you? Did God call you? Let me, let me make this really clear. You wouldn't be here if God didn't call you. You wouldn't be here. The Bible tells us no one seeks after God on their own because we're sinful. We will always choose sin over righteousness. We will. That's in our nature. And so the fact that you're here means God called you. I mean, it's pretty like, like a no-brainer, right? Satan didn't bring you here, right? You're here because God called you by his spirit. That's why you're here. So you're called. You are called. Whether you realize it or not, you're called question is, do you love God? You should, because he called you. He could have left you in darkness. Amen? What's the name of this church? Into the light. Where does that come from? He called us out of darkness and brought us into the light. That's what he did. That's the goodness of God. And we always need to praise him and be thankful because that's what he did for us. The more we know about God, the more we'll love him. Okay? And that's what this whole thing is all about. Let's look at the second thing. Satan's second attack. Number one, again, Satan's second accusation. Number two, Satan's second attack or assault, either one. Verse 7. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his Head. Poor Job, huh? Poor Job. Satan immediately, I believe immediately, right? He'd been wanting to get at Job for a long time. He takes off from heaven. He comes right down to earth and he strikes Job with painful sores all over his body. Now, interesting, let me give you a couple interesting facts. The Hebrew words here describe festering boils. Now, I want you to think about that. That's ugly, isn't it? festering boils. And the word sores here describes the fever and inflammation that result from these sores. And so he's in pain, guys, okay? You got to get this picture. And again, sometimes we read the Bible and we just keep reading and we don't stop for a second to understand what's happened now to Job, okay? He is struck with, with something upon his body that breaks out in sores or boils. It causes inflammation and fever, and he is in the midst of this suffering. Now today, 
when we suffer, when we get a headache or we get something, what do we do? We run and take medicine, don't we? We take antibiotics. We take all these things. Job have any access to antibiotics? No. He just had to sit and endure the pain. And again, I don't want you to miss this. He is suffering. This is bad. Bad, bad. What did he do? Verse 8. He took a piece of broken pottery, right? A broken piece of a pot, like a clay pot, with which to scrape himself while he sat, notice, in the ashes. In the ashes. Now, a couple interesting things about this. And again, you got to get the picture because it's kind of, it's really neat. Job is in so much pain, okay? He looks terrible. Next week, when we get to next week, chapter 3, you're going to see how terrible he looks. He looks so bad, the Bible says next week, that is, they can't even recognize him anymore, okay? That's how bad he looks. He is in this terrible affliction, and he feels so terrible that he don't want to be around anybody, right? Who would want to be around anybody? And so what does he do? He leaves the city, and he goes outside the city where the ashes are, okay? Now, remember, back then, again, specifically, you know your Old Testament, the lepers would always distance themselves from everybody else, right? They would go outside the city. They were away from everybody else, and that's what Job did. Job felt so terrible and miserable. He felt alone that he goes outside from the city, away from everybody. And he takes a broken piece of pottery, and he begins to scrape open his boils. What's he doing? He's itching, right? He's itching. And these are festering. And they're probably, I don't want to get gross, probably filled with pus, right? And so he's trying to relieve himself of the, of the inflammation and the pressure. And he's cutting these things open all over his body. Am I, am I painting a good picture for you? This is what he's going through. And again, this is so sad. And notice, get this, this is really interesting, that he sits in the ashes. What does that mean? He sits in the ashes. Well, what were the ashes? Well, how many of you have ever gone to Mexico? We just seen this the other day in Tecate, and they're burning the trash everywhere. You guys seen that before? Right? That's what they did back then, specifically, right, in these times, is they burnt the trash. They would burn the trash, and they would burn all the dung, okay? they take it outside the city, and they'd put it in piles, and they'd burn it up. And then all that would be left would be ash heaps. And so Job went and sat in this. I mean, is he feeling terrible? He went and sat in these dung heaps. He went and sat in these ash heaps. Get this. Job is literally down in the dumps. Does that make sense? He's literally, and I, I love this picture, he's down in the dumps. He's so broken over what has taken place. He has been struck financially, lost everything. He has been struck emotionally, right? Think about what he's gone through. He lost his children. He lost most of his servants, right? He lost all his animals. And now he's struck physically. I mean, talk about a one, two, three punch, right? I mean, this guy has been beaten down. He's, he's been broken down, but this is where it gets worse. If you thought that was bad enough, how many of you know Satan never stops, huh? He never stops. I'll say it again. He was attacked financially, emotionally, physically, and Satan had one more trick up his sleeve. Isn't that dirty rat, huh? One more trick. And, and guess who Satan uses? Look at verse 9. Then Job's wife said to him, do you still hold fast your integrity, your word? Curse God and die. Curse God and die. Now, what I want to remind you again, a couple things. Number one, Job is a godly man. Amen? That's, we, we clarified that. He's a godly man. For the first time in the story, we're introduced to his wife, right? The mother of there are 10 kids that they just lost, okay? We're introduced to his wife. Now, we know from chapter 1 that Job did his best to raise his kids to serve the Lord. Amen? And so when I read this, and tell me if you would think the same thing, Job is a godly man, 
We see that he tries to raise his kids in the things of God. How many of you would expect that Job had a godly wife? I would, right? Hopefully, we would expect that she was a godly wife. But notice the counsel or advice this wife gives him. She tells Job, curse God and die, okay? Curse God and die. Now, hopefully you would agree that his wife should have been the one to be there to pray for Job, amen? Encourage Job, right? Hang in there, don't give up, right? Continue to go forward. But instead, she tells Job to curse God. Now, let me remind you, who was the one that wanted Job to curse God? Satan, right? This was his idea. He was the one who said he could get Job to curse God. And now, all of a sudden, it's Job's wife who tells Job to do just that. What does that mean? Now, again, I read this, and to me, this is so sad. Because out of all the people on planet Earth who should have been a helper to Job, isn't the wife the helpmate? Did she help him? No. She didn't help him. She did the opposite. She allowed herself to be used by Satan. Do you know that Satan uses other people? Do we know that? He uses other people. You remember he even used the apostle Peter? Do you guys remember that? He told Jesus, no, you're not going to go to the cross, right? I'm going to keep you from dying. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Satan will use whoever will allow themselves to be used by Satan. And that's exactly what Job's wife did. It's sad. Eve allowed Satan to use her with Adam, right? Sarah allowed Satan to use her against Abraham. We see this pattern in the Bible. And I think this is so sad, right? This is so sad. Now, what I want to remind you, especially if you were here last week, is that Satan took all of Job's kids, right? You ever wonder why he didn't take his wife? Think about that. Why didn't he take his wife? Because Satan knew he could use her against Job. That's heavy-duty stuff right there. That's heavy-duty stuff. Satan left her because he knew he could use her against Job. Now, I pray that you would all understand that Satan is trying to use you against other Christians. Isn't that right? Satan wants to use you against your spouse. Satan wants to use you against your friends, right? Against anyone who is trying to serve Jesus. And if you're not careful, you can allow Satan to use you against them. Isn't that scary? That's kind of scary. Again, that should scare you. Now, especially it should scare you because remember what Jesus said. This is a very important lesson. Matthew 18, 6. Jesus speaking says, but whoever causes one of these little ones, speaking of children of God, who believe in me to sin, what did Jesus say? It would be better for them if a millstone, a giant rock, were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. That's what Jesus said. That's how he feels about people who lead other people to sin, who are those sinful influences to get other people to sin. Jesus says, you know, it would be better for you if you went and got a big old rock with a rope and put that rope around your neck and they threw that rock in the ocean and you drowned in the sea. That would be better than the consequences you will face for causing other people to sin. We need to understand, again, this is heavy duty, that Satan will use those closest to us. Do you know that? And it's sad, and it is, it's scary. Satan will use those closest to us. Why? Because the temptation from them will be stronger because we trust those closest to us. And that's why he'll use them if he can. That's why he will use them if he can. First test, financial. Second test, emotional. 
Third test, physical. Fourth test, what? Mental. This was a test. Would he listen to his wife's advice? Would he do what she encouraged him to do? Now think about it. If Job listens, Satan wins. Isn't that right? If Job listens, Satan wins. Always remember that. When you are faced with your temptation, if you listen, Satan wins. And so we have to decide every time, are we going to honor God and make God proud, or are we going to allow Satan to win? Let's look at the last thing tonight. Job's steadfast answer, okay? Job's steadfast answer. Verse 10. But he said to her, right, his wife, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God, and shall we not receive evil? Now, what I love about this, again, and I think this is an example for all husbands. Notice that Job did not call his wife a fool. You guys notice that? He did not do that. He says she speaks like a foolish woman. You guys see that? He was careful. He was not calling her a fool. He simply said, what you're saying sounds like something a foolish woman would say. That's what's Job's point. I believe, again, Job, even in his predicament, understood that his wife was hurting. She was hurting, right? She had just lost her 10 kids, too. He understood what she was going through. He understood that she was talking out of bitterness, maybe anger towards God. And that's why she said what she said. But instead of calling her a fool and, and rebuking her, Job responded to her foolishness with wisdom. And that's what he told her. He tells her, I'll say, read it again. Shall we receive good from God and not evil, right? Are we only just to take the good things from God and, and never take the bad? You see, one of the lessons that our last lesson I think I want you to write down is this, and I love this. Faith in God means accepting the good with the bad. Isn't that right? Faith in God means accepting the good with the bad. Trusting, that's what faith is about. Trusting that God must have a reason for everything he allows. I'll say it again. Faith means accepting the good with the bad. Trusting that God must have a reason for everything he allows. When we go through trials, when we are tested, we are going to find out the type of faith we have, aren't we? We're going to find out what type of faith we have. Do we have faith like Job's wife that causes us to get mad at God and, and upset with him and, and blame him and get bitter? Or are we stronger in our faith? Do we have faith that is more like Job's so that our trials build us, right? Make us stronger and make us better, right? Better, not bitter. That's the choice. That is the choice. Look at our last line, and we're done tonight. In all this, in everything, right, despite everything he went through, Job did not sin with his lips. He didn't blame God. He didn't get bitter again. He continued to trust God, even though he had no idea what was going on. He had no reason, nor did he deserve any of what happened to take place. But he remained strong in his faith in God. And because he was strong in his faith in God, once again, he proved God right. He proved Satan wrong, right? Silencing Satan for the second time. Isn't that beautiful? Silencing Satan for the second time. We'll pick it up next week as Job is visited by his friends. Again, I encourage you to read the rest of the chapter and read chapter 3 as that's what we'll be covering next week. Let's pray. Let's pray. Again, Lord, we thank you, Lord, tonight for your word. Oh, Lord, thank you, Lord God, for these lessons. Thank you, Lord, that you are in control, that despite everything the enemy might try to do against us, Lord, 
there's nothing that you will allow to take place, Lord God, that, again, he does not have your permission for, Lord. Oh, Lord, help us to trust you, Lord, even when we find ourselves in the midst of struggles, trials, temptations, knowing that you love us, Lord, knowing that you will see us through, knowing that you will never again allow us to experience something we can't handle. Oh, Lord, strengthen our faith tonight, Lord God. Remind us that you're a good God who loves us, Lord God. And you do have a reason for everything that you allow, Lord God, even when it makes no sense to us. We love you. We praise you. We thank you tonight, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand, guys. Let's stand.